So good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope this finds you all well. Uh, it's Richard here from the Accounts Payable team. Um, before I hand over to Jamie and the team who are doing today's webinar, um, just a small amount of administration. Um, we will be recording today's session uh, and it will be available uh, after today. Um, the cameras uh, and microphones for attendees, however, will be muted today purely because of numbers uh, and screen access. So if at any point in today's session you have any questions, um, you'll see on the right the questions section. Uh, if you put any questions you have in that area, then we'll be able to see those questions and respond to them either during or at the end of today. Uh, otherwise, um, thank you very much for attending today, uh, and I'd like to hand over to uh, Jamie um, to introduce our guests uh, and to go through today's webinar. Lovely. Thank you, Richard. I'm going to ask Anthony and Michelle to join me on their webcams, if they could. There we go. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> very lonely at the top. I'm on my own. But uh, right, before we start, thank you very much for everybody in attendance. This is the second in a series of masterclasses we're running with Crown. Uh, the first one was amazing. Uh, we've got it down as content. We've got that down. If you want to rewatch that or you want access to that, let us know. Today's session should be just as, as interesting as it was the, the prior session. Um, before we start, can I hand over to Anthony and um, Michelle to introduce yourself, please? Hi. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, uh, Anthony uh, Biondi, head of ECM at Crown. Um, and with Michelle started the first process from a business process review, the, the webinar that we did uh, or the masterclass we did a few months ago. And, and this is a, a next step and, and give some insight as to as to what some of the benefits might be as a consequence of that. So hopefully a, a, a lead on to what we've already done. Lovely. Thank you, Anthony and Michelle. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Kermath. I, I look after the technology and consultancy side um here at crown records management um and ditto to everything anthony just said it's always terrible when you go second because stolen my thunder <laughs> <laughs> always the way always the way but look today as i say is, is a master class so it's an educational session the accounts payable association are doing a, a multitude of these throughout the year we're super excited to run the second one with with our friends at crown and today i believe you're going to take us through um, a guide to going digital. So without further ado, I want to go on to the first slide, which hopefully everybody can see this back uh, at your desks. Um, can I hand over to you, Anthony, on this one? I mean, obviously, just give us an outline of what we're going to talk about today before we get into any specific details. Sure. So um, th this is purely about the benefits of moving to a digital platform, um, what they tend to be from um, a customer's perspective. Uh, there's multiple different versions of it um, from a digital benefits perspective. Um, we've picked six. Um, these are typically the most common and they can be felt either at a departmental level, accounts payable, for example, or across multiple different processes. Um, and the objective today is to give some specific insight as to what they might look like and, and what they might feel like, because it's not just as simple as oh, okay, I've gone down a digital road and now I've got this amount of time or this amount of um, free space to, to now put my documents or things like that. So there's there's a common misconception that um, going into a digital environment is all about saving costs. And while that is an important element of it, there's many other factors to it. And, and our objective today is to walk everyone through each one of those factors, give some perspective, um, and it, as I mentioned right at the beginning, links nicely to our business process reviews and, and how we can help organisations establish which one of these six and the multiple examples within each one are relevant to them. Lovely. And Michelle, anything to add? Um, that, no, other than really the, the, the digital is a bit of a buzzword, isn't it? Um, and for me, it's about getting over here. What does that really mean? People will be on different parts of that journey at the start or the beginning or or what does digital actually mean and encompass? So I think throughout the thread of these as well, that should hopefully understand or from our understanding what going digital actually really means. Lovely. And, and again, you're right. I think, you know, I, I love the way this is structured, the six key points that we're going to go into some depth. Um, as Richard said before he introduced us, if you've got questions uh, throughout the session, please put them in the question box. If we think they're relevant to what we're talking about, well, I'll ask, ask uh, our experts, but if, if it's okay with everybody, we'll make a start. So um, the very first uh, point, if you like, is effectiveness and efficiency. So 
Handing over to um, both uh, Anthony and, and Michelle, um, what, what's the key here? What, what are we, what's the driver? What's, if you like, what's the, uh, the rationale beho behind the first point? Well, I guess most organisations are always looking to optimise what they have already and, and how they can improve on what they're doing. Um, and the middle one of those three examples is the most relevant to what I've just said, which is doing more for less. So when you when you take a manual process right now where you've got lots of data, lots of documents, lots of people running around trying to ascertain answers to questions and solve problems, that typically requires lots of effort, lots of time, um, and, and a digital approach enables you to um, uh, to kind of streamline all of that into one effective process, which means individuals can start behaving on a day-to-day -day basis, doing jobs that they were actually employed to do in the original sense. And, and we talk about um, supplier management later down this process. That's that's one example where working with your suppliers, for example, or improving how you engage with your customers is one way of being more effective and more efficient. Um, it also encourages more proactive behavior. Right now, most individuals, if, if the process is very manual or there's only an element of it that is automated or digital, they're reacting to things. They're, they're, they're reacting to problems. They're reacting to questions, whereas this a more effective and efficient approach enables you to be more proactive, have more control over what's going on in the department, have more visibility of what's going on in the department, which then makes you make informed business decisions rather than reactive ones. Mm, I totally agree. I totally agree with that, Anthony. I think that whole that, that middle part really resonates with the association. Last year, we we did a whole whole piece on doing more with less, or doing more for less or with less. Um, it's been a strange old time for the last two years. So I think this whole effectiveness and efficiency is a really key topic. You could choose this one and speak for an hour on this one particular topic. And what's your point, Michelle? Uh, I, th I think it's quite key when you're asking the question of doing more for less. It's interesting that you had a, um, a whole topic on it previously because, um, you know, doing more what for less what? And, th and that's what you've got to, to pin down. Is it is it doing more work for less money? Is it doing more business for less effort? So it's it's what are you it's it's almost like a key driver question. And the rest of the other things are, are strands from there. So um, you're you're doing less work for and for less effort is is removing the duplicate inputting, um, removing the manual effort, those sorts of things. So, yeah, the doing more for less is is what what for what is what, what do you want to achieve? And it also brings back to the sorry, Jamie, it brings us back to the business process review and working with us to, to help you establish exactly what Michelle has just said. What, what What is doing more for less for you? And and the last point on here is integrating with, with existing applications. Everybody listening to this will have some kind of technical platform supporting them doing what they're doing. Is it being utilised to the best that it's capable of doing? Is it being overutilised? Is it integrating with different applications to, uh, for example, your Office 365 environment? If if it's not integrating with those things, then you're potentially duplicating efforts. Um, and while our objective is ultimately to provide a digital platform, it's not necessarily always the case that additional digital platforms help you be more effective and more efficient. It could be you've already got all of those things in place, but you're not utilising them correctly. They're not being utilised to the best of their abilities. So um, all of those points are relevant and, and the business process review that we've previously spoken about helps you define exactly what effectiveness and efficiency means for you. Lovely, and I think that, that the point that I'd like to pick up there is obviously the very first point on this slide is proactive behaviour, um, and I love that by the way. I think you know the idea of proactive behaviour. I assume what that's meant there is that um, it's all about education. It's what we're doing today. We're doing a masterclass on what what it is to go digital. What's the plan? You know, if you don't if you don't plan, you fail, and, and vice versa. So that pro proactive uh, behaviour. Um, you must see this all the time, Michelle, in your customers when you're consulting with them. What sort of traits do they have? Are they are they inquisitive? Like Anthony just said, sometimes it might not be going digital is the right thing for them, or they may have already started the digital process. But what's that proactive behaviour that you look for? Um, quite often, actually, when you're you're going in consulting, actually, you're you see it by by the opposite by reviewing. You see the reactive behaviour. You know, the reactive behaviour is um, they've 
the, if the work is given to them and that's what the trigger is. There's no going in at the beginning of the day and thinking, right, I'm going to resolve this. This is my objectives. This is what I'm going to deliver because you can have all of those plans and then they're thrown away or awry, whichever word that is, by, um, by the fact that you've, you know, something has come in that was not planned for, that you couldn't see, that the, that um, no system had alerted you or reminded you previously. So the proactive behavior is, is, is around being able to plan and meet those deadlines um, and, and work towards a goal rather than being um, bombarded with lots of other balls. And, and by the way, that proactive behavior isn't also, isn't just uh, a reflection of your own behaviors internal with you in your own department. It could also encourage proactive behavior with your suppliers. So how many, and again, I've touched on this already, and we're gonna to touch on it in a little bit more detail later, but how many people listening have suppliers picking up the phone asking questions? Well, let's give those suppliers the answers in advance so suppliers can take responsibility and be more proactive in their, in their answering of their own questions before they disturb anybody within anybody's team here listening, bothering them with questions that they could have answered themselves. So the proactive behavior is not, and also finally, another point on that is outside of the AP department. So authorized signatories, people that are responsible for signing off invoices that need to be approved let's get them proactively engaging with the AP team rather than the AP team having to react to suppliers chasing them, then having to chase the authorised signatory. Let's flip that on its head and do it the other way around. That's, that's another example of proactive behaviour. It's not just about how the AP are behaving, it's about the team are behaving, it's about all of the supporting elements. Mm. Lovely, thank you for that. So, so picking up on the two last points, so Obviously, integration with these existing applications, and then that statistic at the bottom, 20%, 27%. So, what it's saying there is more than 27% of businesses, business people, do not view their business of, you know, having already gone digital. Um, question for both of you: If an account, if an organisation has an ERP system, are they not already digitised? Is it have they not got digital? Um, go on, Michelle. I was going to say that this almost goes back a little to what I started at the beginning, as in um, that the answer to what is digital can vary for different people and it means different things. So for me, being digital is less of a thing in itself and actually a more way of doing things. So it's about being able to unlock the value and growth in your in your processes and, and business. It's about using the data to make quicker and better decisions. It's about being able to devolve those decisions to smaller teams, being more agile. So it's really about re-examining the entire way that you are working um, or you're doing business and then rethinking your approach to match that. So having an ERP is not being digital in itself, but it's a tool that can assist in, in being digital. Because if it's if it's standalone, you're manually inputting information in and out, it, the, the data that's going in isn't clean and therefore clean data is not coming out. It's not it's not the tool that's actually helping you. It's not it, it's it's just an electronic device. It's not it's not helping on doing something digitally. That's, don't know what you think, you think Anthony. Do you believe? Not, you I, I have absolutely nothing to add. Uh, <laughs> perfectly articulated. Um, it, it isn't a thing. It, it's what you do with it and and how it works for you rather than. Um, having somewhere where it's stored, which is effectively what an ERP system is. It's it's information stored in an area that then enables you to operate in certain parameters. Of course it is, and um, and this is, we're not belittling it, it's absolutely essential to an AP department, but there are multiple elements that contribute to that ERP system existing, um, and that's the bit that, that can really add value to the business. Yeah, and if you're not reporting on that data, if that data within that system can't help you, you can't make better decisions, you can't think about working differently, you can't um, or change a process or, or ask another team to assist. So it's not it's not helping you if that data is not being used to report and measure and perform on either. Lovely, thank you for that. So with that said, I think we've covered point one. If we move on to point two, um, I'm driving the slides, so please apologise if you can't see them, but I'm hoping you can. So, so point two here is all about compliance. So give us give us an overview. I mean, we know what compliance means in accounts payable. You know, this could be audit, this could be compliance with regulatory controls they've got. But from a digital point of view, what, what do we mean by compliance? Um, we, we mean security. We mean um, 
uh, as as one of the options there, control and accountability. It's it's not just about an audit trail and being able to being able to see what actions have happened where, and it's not about adhering to quality standards. It, it, it's about removing things that keep people away at night, awake at night. It, it, and and those control the control and accountability and the control and visibility is is a key element. Um, also, it removes risk. Risk is also compliance. Um, and as it suggests at the bottom, a lot of a lot of the reasons why data breaches happen is down to human error, and that's not a deliberate thing. It's simply because access to information is not restricted, it's not secure, it's not defined by your business role or your requirement or the reasons why you need to access that information. Um, also, it can't be tracked in any real way. Um, there's no accountability for who's done what to where and how. So it, it's a multiple of things that fit around removing the risk. That's that's what it is, which is everything from quality standards to, to information being given to the wrong person at the wrong time. Yeah, and and, to, and that's all about the um, the data element as well. It's about being confident. That for me, compliance is well about being confident in your in your data, in your processes, and in your systems, because all of those three things will help you pass an ISO certification, for instance, and and uh, other things like that. So it's about being confident in the um, in your data, because at the end of the day. The element at the bottom of this process is is the data that you're using, and if you're sure that you've got the right data, that that data is controlled and secure and only accessed by the right people, if 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 you know that that um, is up to date information as well and it's reliable information and data, then that then you're you're already passing a lot of compliance um, standards. Uh, let's be honest, it's not the sexiest of topics, is it? Um, no, no, nobody gets excited about it. But it's it's the bare principles of everything we have to adhere to, whatever department you're in, whatever organized type of organization you are, whatever job role you have, it, it's kind of the bread and butter of how your organization needs to operate. And it's it's still amazing how many how many people take shortcuts, again, not deliberately, but simply because their time and their systems and their processes don't allow them, don't enable them to have the best compliance relevant to their particular process and their particular industry. What a digital approach enables you to do is tick all the compliance boxes at the box. Straight away, the moment everything is in a digital environment, the moment you can lock down who can access what, the moment you can set parameters and, and, and track the usage and the viewing and who's actioning certain information. You tick all of the compliance boxes before you start thinking about cost savings and remote working and things like that. This is this is bread and butter stuff that be, at the moment, most people are having to take shortcuts if they're not fully digital. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with you, Anthony. I think, you know, uh, we're, we're at the association, we teach different levels of courses, and one of the core modules we teach is around con compli compliance and controls. Um, and it's it's mainly overlooked. It's always somebody else's issue. It's somebody else's department, somebody else's responsibility. But actually, when you're looking at going digital, absolutely, it's, it might, it's the core, it's the bedrock of what you should be. So it's not only sort of, you know, compliance in terms of the digital aspects, it's all the manual process, it's all the other steps you've got to take to go towards digital, so whether it's quality standards, audit trails, and um, a lot of the time in the accounts payable world, audit trails are printed and popped into you know, folders. Yeah, exactly that. Look, yeah. This is where you need to start reviewing these audit trails, which is a key part of what you do, no doubt. Exactly that, and, and we go back to the previous slide with proactive um, actions. This is another example of that. From an audit perspective, once you've got everything digital, and Michelle will correct me where, if I'm wrong here because she's far smarter than I from a technology perspective, it's almost a click of a button. If you want to do an audit trail of a process or a document or a, a set of instances that happened, being able to, to access that information quickly and appropriately and effectively and share it by the way because let's not forget you've got organizations external to yours coming in and going right show me this show me that show me this and how long does that take somebody to put together and how accurate is it how secure is it how safe is it 
from a digital world, it's a click of a button. There you go, there's everything. Here's a full audit trail, which includes dates, times, IP addresses, specific access, specific ed actions. You know, you can lock things down so people can't print them. They can't email them, they can't edit them. All these things contribute to a, to a completely compliant environment in addition to the quality of standards that, that have to be adhered to anyway. Yep, love it. And, and again, I think that last thing about, you know, control and accountability, um, that's what we're all striving for ultimately. So all the other good, uh, great points, but control and accountability, definitely in an accounts payable world, is, you know, when we all get audited, which we do, we seem to be audited every month, let alone every, every year. Um, control and accountability is the key aspect. And actually a lot of drivers around uh, digitizing processes or policies or procedures all come to that control and accountability. So I think it's a nice area to sort of finish there. So just a question for both of you. Um, how easy is it for an accounts payable team to manage an audit once they become digital? Uh, uh, an audit is uh, it's looking at your financial information, isn't it? The financial data of, um, of an organisation and it's about how the transactions are recorded um, and whether it shows an accurate view of your business operations. So the main focus of all of that is the AP department, isn't it? So using AP automation, you know, you're know, you storing your data, data storage, the management, um, electronic invoicing, all aids the, the audit process because you know, you're know you storing a transaction history, so you've got instant reporting, as Anthony just said. There's no looking through heaps of paper, um, like a needle in a haystack kind of approach. You could even give your auditor read-only access into your system so that they can go in and, and look into transactions and things themselves. That would could mean that the process takes hours instead of instead of days. Um, and it can also highlight the vulnerabilities or other areas. So, you know, vendor information, missing information, duplicates, all the, all the things that um, show up that a process isn't, isn't working properly. So it's an, it's an instant audit trail the minute anything happens in, in a system. So it's, uh, it's all there and quite easy for, or as, as Anthony said, a, a click of a few buttons, maybe. Yeah, maybe not just one. <laughs> maybe not one button. No, I think that's probably the truth. <laughs> you make it sound so so simple, aren't they? Uh, right, okay, so look, I mean, the next one we're going to get on, so the next uh, slide, I think is probably the one of the most relevant in the current last couple of years. So, you know, the, the next slide itself is is working from home and everybody on the call, everybody who's watching in as well, part of the Masterclass series will have had to adapt to this. So, so again, over, over to yourself, Michelle and, and Anthony, um, what's changed? What? Why is this important in a digital world? Go on, Michelle. I was just going to say again, this goes back to the beginning of what does it's what is digital? This is digital is a way of doing things differently. It's it's, it's the doing of things. So um, it's how they can do these things or how people can work from from home. So there's there's so many great um, tools out there now to to help with the collaboration and things. But it's the tools around the the data that's the most important thing. And People at home want to be reassured that they're actually still working with the right information, the right data. Um, and, you know, you, you miss those little conversations you know, next to the photocopier or, or while you're making coffee, just, you know, to, to reassure yourself, you know, about a process or the way to do something. And it's about being confident and comfortable working, working from home with the information and the tools that you've got. It's also, again, making sure that people, going back to slide number one, can be working in effective and an efficient manner. Um, if, if you've got a digital platform that enables you to collaborate internally and externally from your living room, from your dining room, from your office network, th those conversations, while they're great and valuable via a photocopier, they're, no, they're, no, they're, they're no longer essential for your business and your AP department to operate effectively. They're no longer essential for you to be efficient in how you do things because you can communicate via one platform um, on specific queries, on specific processes, on specific invoices, on specific challenges. All of that information can be logged and recorded. So again, going back to the audit and the compliance piece, you've got a full audit trail of what conversations have happened with whom and and how the you know what the results of all of those were. Also, from a business's perspective they're confident that the information that they don't want 
going outside of their business or that their suppliers or that their customers need to feel secure about because they're secure access, because everything is locked down, people aren't able to print things at home and let's be honest, you know, how many people are doing that anyway. But if somebody did want to print something at home and do something funny with it, they can't. Um, they can only access and do things that they can do. And the, 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 the people running these teams and the, the senior people within the organizations can feel comfortable and confident that their data, their information isn't being mishandled. It's being secured. Um, and, and let's be honest, it's the new way of going about things. COVID has brought lots of disastrous things to us. But in my opinion, this is one of the positive, very few things, but it's a positive approach. And we talk about it with staff retention later working from home is is a platform now it is something that people are looking to do either as an employee or as an employer and having a digital environment enables you to carry on operating in the effective and an efficient way but from anywhere yeah and, and you know what the, one of the things we do at the association we do lots of surveys we work with lots of partners such as yourselves and we also work with a lot of recruitment partners and what they're telling us is that clearly that um, hybrid working, working from home is here to stay. That's not going away anytime soon. Um, the whole issue, if you like, that was once having the systems and the capability and the digital platform for employees to work from home is getting better, but it's not quite there. And I think this slide's quite quite important because um, when people are recruiting now, especially in the world of transactional finance and accounts payable, it actually is one of the criteria. Um, is there a hybrid of working environment? What are the platforms that we use and what's the data we can access? And also then from a, an employer's point of view, they're interested in obviously the control aspect, you know, what controls are going to place to avoid things like fraud or error prevention. Um, and, and one of my questions for both of you actually is, um, how can an AP team still collaborate whilst working from home? I'm assuming it's from a digital point of view. So if you could answer that for me, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so, I, I mean, there are, there are two or three answers to that question. Um, the first and most common one is, um, almost like a team's approach, but it, it's 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 a lot more um, streamlined and a lot more specific to the processes and documents that you're working with. So collaboration in terms of communicating very quickly and very effectively um, without having to you know, wait for specific responses. Um, and those questions can also kick off tasks and workflows. So you can assign certain um, requirements and tasks to individual much quicker. It's much more uh, efficient in that sense. Um, one of the other answers is, is, is you've, and, and Michelle's touched on this previously, you've got dashboards. So because you've got dashboards available to you, giving you an entire view of the operational side of an AP process, but also the financial elements of it, how many invoices have we got out, up for payment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because all of that information is being logged by and kept within this one dashboard, being able to ascertain and understand exactly where it, the information is, and then being able to proactively push that through, through the collaboration tool that I mentioned earlier, means that people could be in all four corners of the country, but actually proactively engaging with each other through the dashboard, through the, through the chat system, um, as well as the workflows that are then kicked off as a consequence of that via tasks, things like that. Does that make sense? And to, and to add to that as well, I think, you know, from someone that also works from home, obviously, there's an element of you, you want to feel comfortable with the applications that you're using. And, and that also means you don't want to have to use 10 applications just to do the same work you were doing whilst um, in the office. So you, you want the tools to be able to do all of those things that Anthony's just mentioned, but ultimately in one place. And if it's not all one tool, that they're integrating together so that you actually feel like you're not isolated at home. You, you don't know where this, what information's in what system or, or how to access it. You want to feel confident and comfortable when you're working at home that there are people at the, the end, other end you know, that, that, you know, that you can talk to quickly or that there is information in the right place and that the systems are speaking to each other. Because working from home and trying to fix something can feel like it can take a lot longer. So ultimately, you want to be giving the right tools, platforms, applications, systems and processes that are making you feel that they that they don't. The, the most successful implementations I've ever been involved in have a the least amount of impact in terms of changing how somebody currently works. Uh, that, that, you know, our objective here is not, as Michelle has just said, to go, right, now you're working from home is another application that you've got to be thinking of because that's just a pain for everybody. Actually, what we try and achieve is 
integrate and implement our technology with the systems you're already using and the tools that come with our technologies prop up the other ones for want of a better term or support the other ones not prop them up they support them plug the gaps so that individuals working from an unfamiliar environment home in terms of work context are using familiar tools from a digital perspective to get their job done and it's not causing them additional headaches otherwise what would be the point yeah, I love that, Anthony, and, and I think that's the thing. I mean, your statistic down the bottom, 30% of people, business people say allowing employees to work from home efficiently is now a key driver for the digital transformation. And, and what you just articulated there is it actually is a two-way street now. You know, employee, employees and employers are looking for the same thing. They're looking for ease of use, control, they're looking for one platform wherever possible. It's that whole collaboration is a two-way street. It's not just an employer expect there's an expectant of an employer to get their employee to perform a certain task. It's actually the tools and the skills and all the stuff that comes with that, which is becoming really important. It sort of goes back to my earlier point about um, when people are looking for roles now, this is actually a really important part. What are the tools? What what digital products are you utilizing? How do we collaborate? This is really important stuff for both employers and employees. So it's a it really is. topic. And, and just one final point on it, the, 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 the key point in that statement at the bottom is work at home efficiently. Getting people to work from home with technology isn't an overly difficult thing to do. Give them a laptop, give them a couple of screens, bang, you're away. Actually, it's the efficient piece. That's the key bit. And, 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 and why is that hybrid? So ultimately, you know, are people working in a hybrid way because they have to come into the office because they can actually do so much at home, then they have to finish off the tasks when they come into the office. A, a true hybrid approach shouldn't be for that specifically. So if you've got to go into the office because you can't complete a process at home, then, then that's not true hybrid or remote working, is it? It's not true digital um, transformation. So, you know, I'd look at those tasks as well as what, what, why is it hybrid? What do they have to do when they come back in the office? Yep, totally great. And I think, again, talking to our members, talking to our community, what they tell us quite quite clearly is that productivity during the last two years has gone up, um, but actually the work-life balance can be a bit strained, where mm -hmm. you feel you're working a little longer, you're working with, you know, maybe you're not collaborating the way you should do, but because you're working from home, you're working those longer hours, I think this is the reason why this whole, you know, move to maybe one pl single platform, maybe more of a digital approach to this. Um, I think that's the, the, the sign of the, for the future, because it's yeah. one thing about being more productive, but how long does that last if you don't go to one platform and fully yeah. digitize your process? Okay, yeah. so let's let's move on to the next slide. And I think this is one that Anthony uh, mentioned earlier, which is um, effectively customer and supplier engagement. So again, you know, from a, from a customer and a supplier engagement point of view, in the world of accounts payable, we will know our customers as our suppliers generally. But just just explain that too, if you could. You know the the the, the base of this slide for us. Yeah. So I I don't know how relevant a, a customer um, engagement is from an AP clerk's perspective, um, but supplier absolutely is. Um, and 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 again, I did touch on it earlier. How many how many people listening to this are constantly bothered by suppliers? How many of them are picking up the phone? It's a big part of the job. In my very early career, it was something that I did. I was in the AP department and the majority of my time was dealing with supplier queries, whether it be where's payment? Have you received the invoice? Um, how much of it is being settled? All the obvious questions that takes up, especially the bigger the department, the bigger the amount of invoices you process. Um, it's all relative, but ultimately, the more of them that you deal with, the harder it is to collaborate on that things. And, and there's multiple different elements that an AP clerk has then got to deal with. They're dealing with the supplier call themselves. More often than not, the problem isn't actually with the AP department. It's sometimes outside of the AP department and therefore out of their control. So then they're having to source that information, which takes time. In that time, you've got the supplier ringing you back again. It could be an, an, an addition, a, a somebody else from the credit control team at your supplier chasing you. Suddenly, you just find yourself constantly going round and round in circles trying to find the problem. And then you have to solve it and then you have to get back to your supplier. And frankly, who wants to be shouting at constantly? So ultimately, because you're digital, because you've got everything um, in one location, because you can open that platform up to your suppliers, you put the emphasis back on them. 
you give them the ability to answer their own questions and therefore the phone calls you get which was always going to exist you're always going to get someone picking up the phone saying how do i deal with this but even if they've not been able to find that information via the platform you finding the information and giving them an answer is significantly quicker so we're not suggesting here for a moment that we're going to eradicate all supplier phone calls that's never going to happen but what we are going to do is when you get them we're going to make answering them much quicker much easier and therefore make time for you to get on with the jobs you're actually supposed to be doing rather than listening to people waffle on down your ear asking for payment and also from this supplier's perspective um you know if they're if they're if they're phoned up and they've got the query but in the ap team have to go outside of their own uh, sphere of knowledge to get that answer so they've and in the meantime the supplier phones again and they get a different person and because there's no central one master one system each individual is going to keep going off to find the information unless they get the same person same same update so it, it's it's not just from you know helping the ap team give the answer but from a supplier they can they can just have one route in and one one master source of data. And the supplier is also, by the way, doesn't necessarily have to be the external element. So we within Crown raise purchase orders. Um, and you've got the entire process that goes with that. That 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 can cause a pain from you know somebody like me ringing an accounts payable department here. By the way, we use this, so it's not a real thing. Um, but ultimately, what um, me picking up the phone and querying my purchase orders and the process associated to that is adding the, to the extra workload from an AP clerk's perspective. So it can also be used as an internal tool to make sure that the queries coming in from an internal perspective are dealt with at source rather than having to go through the same process of picking up the phone yeah and, and again you know from from a from the world of accounts payable um i think you hit the nail on the head earlier anthony that um yes we do get lots of queries we do get lots of phone calls and and guess what the phone calls tend not to be people phoning up and telling us what a wonderful job we've done it's normally somebody chasing you um you know payments or even that could be internal stakeholders as well people phoning up where's the invoice why we you know why is this not being paid etc so i think I, I like this approach which is this if you like the middle one the proactive uh, approach so what you're effectively doing using you know, digital tools digital solutions you are proactively providing data uh, at the touch of a finger rather than you know you do the usual thing when somebody phones in and you have to go through systems you have to try and find the answer you get boinged telephone tennis a little bit between businesses and what usually happens in those environments is when when a supplier phones up and wants uh, to effectively get to an answer whether it's payments or whatever um they get very annoyed very quickly because all they're expecting is that an answer to their query so if you haven't got it and then you pass to your colleague and the colleague doesn't know where to get it from and and the platform itself doesn't support you can have angry suppliers which means ultimately you can have broken relationships with suppliers and i think this whole thing around supplier performance evolves around the relationship so again going back to that digital um process if you like as a point if you can have data to hand easy accessible data with your digital process as well as improving proactively your supplier performance can only mean one thing which is less phone calls less queries and Michelle I'm assuming that when you're consulting with businesses that's what you sort of tell them absolutely and and also try to put a measure on that so you know if you're if you can capture a snapshot of a, a period of time of how many suppliers are chasing queries how many supplier calls and then you can put um, an estimate around that you can actually give um give back whilst you're consulting a, a true snapshot of how it could be improved in the future and i also do that based on um you know if all of this works better and you're paying the bills quicker you know you can access early payment discounts or or you can avoid late payment charges so it can it can come down to to those sorts of aspects as well and also while i said right at the beginning there isn't uh, a, 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 an importance from a customer perspective i guess as an ap department it, it, you're not having that direct integration uh, or interaction with your customers but the people that are ordering things from your suppliers that are then being passed on to your customers in one way, shape or form are. And while things like putting on being put on stop are extreme examples of this, but ultimately, if invoices aren't getting paid and 
goods are being delayed in, in being received and then that passes on to your customer, there is an impact from a revenue perspective. That could harm your business's ability to earn more money and, and keep a customer satisfaction and um, all that all that all that good stuff. So there is a direct there is a there is a knock on effect to your customers based on the relationship that you have with your suppliers. Yeah, and, and, and I totally agree. So accounts payable wouldn't really resonate with the idea of customer, but actually they do, because an internal stakeholder, somebody within their operations team, um, exactly, yeah. other people, they're customers, they're internal customers. Um, and again, you know, what we preach at the Accounts Payable Association is good customer service. And you can only provide good customer service if you've got the right tools to actually then go and provide good customer service. So again, I think the points really, really resonate with our audience. And I'd love to see actually if you've got if you think the customer service and you know in terms of good supplier relationship and good supplier engagement is important in the world of accounts belt drop a little note in the questions box because i'd be interested to take that on and, and maybe answer that point later okay so let's move on to the next point if we can um which is really really resonant at the moment which is all about staff retention and attraction so again you know before we start this one by the way the world of accounts payable and generally the world of finance it's a tough market to bring people in at the moment. Um, it's a very candidate-led um, market at the moment. And also, and not only retaining the staff, but attracting them in the first place. So how does digital um, help uh, organizations not only to retain them, but attract them as well, please? I, uh, we've touched on most of them, um, and we'll just get, you know just just go into a little bit more detail on them. I guess you know, the remote working is, is one obviously we've discussed, and you know, in the old days, and by old days I mean before COVID, the questions were, you know, can I have flexi time or um, do I get a car allowance, that type of stuff. Um, now across the board, the question tends to be. What, what's the situation with regards to remote working? What are you able to offer me so I can find that work-life balance, which everybody seems to be shifting towards? Um, so being able to offer it, point number one, and as we've already touched on, being able to offer it in a way that gets the most out of them and gets the most benefit to the employer is point number two. So being able to utilize the digital platform. And most people now, when they're asking about remote working, are then caveating that with, and what are you gonna provide me? What environment are you gonna give me to make sure that that remote working is effective for me? Because if you give me remote working, but I spend six hours on the phone chasing things and, and having to do my job because the systems I've got available to me are no good, then what's the point? I'm not interested. So being able to offer it, is an important point being able to demonstrate how effective and efficient and how happy it can be is even more important um but let's not just focus on remote working it's not that you know there's still lots of people moving back to the office there's still lots of people that want to be in the office and that need to be in the office so being able to improve the processes to remove stress and the mundane tasks that we've spoken about suppliers picking up the phone dealing with your own internal customers the stress of doing month end and the audit trails associated to that these are all things that take time they they bring pressures um they they bring um their own individual concerns and stresses so able being able to streamline those things give access to people to the information that they need quickly and effectively removes those stress so people don't tend to then leave because they're stressed if they've got in a working environment that they feel comfortable in that they're contributing to um, that, that offers them a satisfaction and they feel like um, they're getting value from them, they're less likely to leave. Um, and, and let's be honest, it's it's 2022. There's, there's a modern approach now to doing things. Um, and as we've discussed, di digital isn't a complex thing. It isn't a scary thing. It doesn't have to be really expensive. It doesn't have to take six to 12 months to get you up and running and live. We're, you know, organizations like ours, are, are very streamlined and effective now in this approach um, and getting you to that modern approach is 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 not a difficult and expensive thing necessarily no and it's it, it's it's about for me as well so that it's about reactive and we went you know talk about the proactive it's reactive processing that is you know is, is the is the stressful element the mundane element that that you're not actually feel like you're contributing to anything if you, you know you want to see that you are and you want other people to be able to see that you are um ultimately and reactive processing you know, accounts payable can receive hundreds thousands of invoices and each of those invoices come with their own deadlines payment terms um approval process um 
you know, the AP team are trying to maintain or, or fix those vendor relationships or supplier relationships that we were talking about, maybe extending pay periods, um, getting the information ready for audits. There's so, so many tasks and all of those are juggling deadlines um, and they're reacting to those deadlines. And what, and what happens is actually to meet those deadlines becomes the normal success criteria. That, that's the measurement, you know, just, just to meet those deadlines that are usually set by others um, becomes the measurement of success. Whereas proactive processing, you know, where you're removing the unnecessary intervention across the whole process, um, reducing the amount of time to simply pay the bills, um, the, the manual data entry, you know, you're reducing the errors, there's automated invoice routing um, for both the accounts payable team or other people. You know, the 80-20 rule, if you can get rid of 80% and it goes through without manual interve intervention, um, it leaves the, you know, the AP team experts to deal with the 20% that is more complex um, and getting them more involved in the, the vendor management, supplier management, supplier engagement, um, and utilizing their skills and expertise and that's where the satisfaction comes from and, it, and going back to your point jamie with regards to you know attracting people it's not just about keeping the people that you have but attracting the right people being able to sit in, sit in an interview process and go look this is how we operate this is the tool these are the tools that you'll be using look and, and demonstrate to them get them in a room and interview gone are the days where an interview is about me walking in going look how brilliant i am please recruit me it's the other way around it's it's a 50 it absolutely is a 50 50 um uh, uh, um approach now and it's important that ap managers and departmentals heads can can present to people that are looking to get into this look at what we do and and i know you have partnerships with people like hayes being able to um, push through that type of relationship. Look at look at how we operate. Look at look at how and and get people to you rather than going to your competitors and other AP departments and other businesses. Differentiate yourself. Stand. Make yourself stand out. And and one final point from me on this. It doesn't happen all the time. I, I'm not tiring everybody with the same brush here. But on many occasions. It is obvious to us when we go in and do our business process reviews that you've got the AP um, clerks on the shop floor working as hard as they are day to day. And then you've got managers and, and more importantly, the people above the managers that don't really understand what goes on down here. They don't really have a deep understanding and, and to a certain extent, they don't need to. But I think sometimes the finger is always pointed at the AP clerk and the the, the, the manager of an AP team um, without really a deep understanding of what they get up to on a day to day basis and how much firefighting they're doing. Um, and that can be quite disheartening. So being able to automate and digitize these processes means that the people above all of these people can have a real understanding of what's going on. And there's an accountability to it as well. This is what we do on a day to day basis. This is how we solve the problems. Yep, I love that, Anthony. I think, you know, that's that goes back to that point, doesn't it? It's all about the visibility part. Um, far too often, accounts payable absolutely get the blame for what's going on. And there's probably a very small proportion of activity that AP can actually sort of influence, if you like. There's all this stuff yeah. pre and post that go on. Um, but actually having the visibility through a digital um, solution at least gives you the, the idea where the, the the break in the processes. So when you go through your initial uh, plan where Michelle would go in and look at the business process reviews, you're analysing where the processes are right and going wrong. This is actually giving the visuals as well. It's actually showing C-suite levels. Look, it's not necessarily all the AP's uh, issue. And actually look how hard these guys are working. And that's the thing for us as an industry. These are the tools that we absolutely need to do more and more. Um, just before we go on to the next slide, I just, by the way, I just needed to pick up this, this quote. I love that quote, by the way. Start the retention process when the person is still open to staying, not after they've already told you they're leaving. What, what a great quote to have. Far too often in every industry, not just in accounts payable, people react to things when, when uh, something goes wrong or, or they've been told they're going to leave actually having a staff retention and attraction policy and having the tools having the digital processes and um, systems around you that make them feel they want to be there and make them feel part of the process i couldn't agree more strongly with that that part there so uh, excellent quote and I, I probably will be borrowing that quote let's put it that way so uh, great one okay so look we're, we're coming towards the end of uh, the session today we've got one more point before we go on um 
quite relevant actually in, in today's world. We've gone through quite a strange period the last couple of years. The economy started to grow again, which is excellent to see. But actually businesses, while they start to grow, they absolutely would be looking for opportunity to make cost savings. So um, take us through this slide if you could both. Um, what, what does digital, uh, you know, becoming digital, how does that improve cost savings within an organization? Yeah, this is this is such a bright again, we said right at the beginning, you could you could you could probably do five hours on this one slide, frankly. Um, I think in its most simplistic sense for me, I kind of break it down into two areas. You've got the tangible costs and then you've got the intangible costs. So when people think of cost saving, they initially go to um, and, and frankly, this is why sometimes conversations with organisations like us don't happen because they initially feel that means I've got to lose people. A absolutely not. It's it's that's very rarely. I've never implemented a solution um, where anybody's lost their job as a consequence of it. Far from it. The, the tangible things are are things like time. So um, you can with with the business process reviews in particular that Michelle does, we can go in and we can really define how much time an individual or a department is spending from day to day on this process. And, and that's a tangible cost. Now, while there may not be a physical saving in the, okay, if you cut that out, there's gonna be a pot of money in the corner for you. It's about applying your time to the things that, that, are the, that are the most relevant and the most impactful. And Michelle touched on it earlier, that 80-20 rule. You know, no digital platform out there is going to remove everything 100%. It doesn't exist. It can't exist. But ultimately, what we're going to do is take the majority away from you so that rather than you spending 60, 70% on the mundane tasks, you're actually not spending any time on those now, which now enables you to put more time and effort into the things that really make a value difference to the, to the process. So that's a tangible example. Another one, which is the most basic of all, we did some work with... Um, Network Rail a few years ago. This is this was before my crown days, um, and they were spending twenty five thousand pounds a year on paper in their accounts payable department, um, which is a very tangible cost, right? Implement a digital solution, twenty five grand saved, bang, they won. Um, there's there's an element of return on investment. So there's tangible elements. To it. The intangible ones are, are, are the ones that most people don't think of and actually can add the most value. So one of those is compliance. It's a it's an intangible thing, but if if um, you're not compliant and you're not following the guidelines and you're not doing your audit trails properly, there could be financial penalties to that. There could be consequences to that. People could lose their jobs as a consequence of that. That's a cost benefit, but it's an intangible one. Sustainability, which we've spoken about there, everybody's talking about quite rightly being green and, and performing better as a business from a sustainability perspective, identifying what our carbon footprints are and improving them. With our business process reviews, we can look at how an AP department is impacting the sustainability growth um, and objectives within an organization. Now, that's an intangible benefit right there. There isn't likely to be a pot of money at the end of it, but being able to contribute and quote what you're able to um, achieve from a sustainability is another piece. Michelle spoke about it earlier. Um, moving on to another element, which is um, early and late payment benefits and, and penalties. Again, there's probably not one example of what that might be from a cost saving perspective, but because you're digital, because you're now able to utilize the early payment and because you're now not let getting penalized, there's there's a return on investment. So again, during the business process reviews, Michelle will look at all of these things and go, right, your benefits are time, tangible. We're, be, we're gonna be able to contribute to your sustainability goals. You're gonna be more compliant, which reduces any risks from a security perspective. Um, recruitment is another one. If you're losing people because they're dealing with the mundane tasks, because they're stressed, because you're not in a modern approach, you're probably having to pay a recruitment agent every time you're having to recruit someone. Well, let's because your staff turnover is now gonna be potentially less because of a digital approach, you're paying less out in fees. There's an intangible return on investment. Um, and, and I touched on uh, a couple of other elements as well. I'll, I'll pause there because I recognise that was quite a lot of information. But um, <laughs> did that make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Michelle? It did, yeah. And I think the, 
there's, there's two only, only two things I can really add to that, which is um, when we talk about cost savings per se, which is obviously very, very tangible. What's quite interesting is that when you go, I go into a company, it's quite rare if I can actually get someone to tell me what they, their current um, cost is to process an invoice per invoice. It's, it's very rare if anybody can actually put their finger on on that on that cost. So it's quite an interesting um, start to a project to try and actually get the benchmark of what it is currently costing you now to process an invoice and then and then show how we can then save that um, over over a change to their process or, or automation. So there's that. And, and then also the time there is. Yes, there's the time on how much you're saving to do a task. but there's work time, but there's also wait time. So how much in your process is actually you just waiting or it's got to get over to there to a different office or a different person and they only work on Thursday. So you have to add in two days wait here. There's a whole element of saving, which is routing stuff automatically or being able to do something in a touch of a button rather than having to sign something or stamp something or the real old school ways of doing things. Then, you know, that there's there's those time savings as well. So and quite often they're they're, they're they are intangible because there's no you know three days to wait for someone is not something you can put into a, a time saving really but that's three days of a process that's just been shorted and that's how you get your early payment discounts or or things like that and anybody that um, hasn't watched the business process review masterclass and i recommend you do because it's amazing um <laughs> we talk about the why and this is exactly what the why this is one of the main reasons, one of the main focuses on the why. Why am I going to go digital? Why am I going to invest more money in another piece of technology and all of the associated services associated, uh, uh, relevant to it? This is what will help you define. This is the why. And that why might be the tangible cost I mentioned. It might be the intangible. It might be a combination of the two. It might only be one thing. But what we're there to do is define the why and give you that return on investment before you move forward with the technology and i can't stress that enough understanding the why which sits into everything i've waffled about for the last couple of minutes is 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 the most important thing for me yeah it it, it is the starting point it's the reason or the motivation or the or the trigger that that um and, and it's not even necessarily you know why am i going to have this application it's why do i want to change things it's, it's yeah why a, do i want to change it you know what why is this a problem um you know, why do I do what I'm doing? It's, it's, you know, you're starting with those questions and then, then you're going into the, because then that gives you the purpose to the what, um, you know, what is it that I want to accomplish then, or what are the needs of my stakeholders or, you know, before we get into all the other W's, which there are in that process. Well, look, I mean, we're, before we get into the end of the, the hour session that we've allotted today, we could speak for another five hours, six hours, but look, it's been absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, there's a bunch of questions in in the um, in the, the Q and A part. Let me ask you one question, which came to, is, a, is a common theme, and it, it's all about. I mean, the, the six points everybody agrees are, are are amazing, and I assume, by the way, that you'll send the six points out to all the people who are watching, all the people who unfortunately couldn't get to watch that. So we'll make sure that everybody gets that. Um, the overriding question that seems to be coming out is. Um, how do they start a project such as this? You know, they, they believe that it's the right thing to do. And actually at the moment, they haven't got C-suite uh, level buy-in. Is there a process? Do they have to be brave? Do they go through the six points here and, and sort of work upwards? What, what's your view and, and advice on that one? It's a great question. And um, the, 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 the best approach, is, as we've just mentioned, is if you've not got C-level buy-in, you, you've got to get it. And to get it, you've got to justify it. Um, and you've got to you've got to paint a picture as to why, as we keep saying, it's important to do it. Um, and the best way to do that is is get Michelle in. She'll look at your processes from beginning to end, highlight all the bottlenecks, look at the technologies that you're already using because you may be able to utilize what you've already got. You don't necessarily have to buy another piece of technology to solve your problem. You might already have it in your infrastructure. Um, look at how you're engaging with people and understand what your objectives are. You know, is it because you're losing loads of staff and we need to focus on how we improve their environment? Is it because it's costing you lots of money to process an invoice and what is that cost? So to answer your question, don't don't focus on the technology at this point because you might already have it, frankly. And even if you don't, um, that's way down the line. My my recommendation would engage with Michelle, get her in to review your processes with you, ask the relevant questions and help you build a case study and a return on investment business case 
go to the people that that, that that do ultimately make the decisions and say, if we don't do this, we're going to have these problems from a compliance perspective. We're going to be losing people hand over fist. It's currently costing us this amount of money to process our invoice. That sustainability message that you're doing as a business, we ain't going to hit it for these reasons. That's what I would recommend. And, and just, just to add to that, uh, just to justify a business process review, you know, take a, take a step back and look at your look at your measurements, look at your performance reports, look at your compliance and complaints, all, all the, the six areas we've just here and ask yourself why in all of those areas and how you can justify, you know, um, some stats around there. And that's that's your business case of, of who can do this business process review. How much time is it going to take? What what can I actually fix? That's that's what you've got to do to, to start looking at why you need the BPR. Lovely, well, thank you both for that. Your expertise, as always, is, is well appreciated. You've been listening to a guide to going digital today. We've covered the six key areas, effectiveness and efficiency, compliance, remote working, customer and supplier engagements, staff retention and attraction, and cost saving. And as Anthony said, if you want guidance from that, definitely go and watch the first of the series. And also, if you need any support, I'm sure that Anthony and Michelle would be more than happy to support. Thank you so much for uh, listening in today. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Michelle. And no doubt we'll speak. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.